so much. So um, it occurred to me that there had been a lot of interest uh, in and around the topic of citizenship. So I wanted to say my last book is about cultural citizenship. This is it. I mean, there's no point in having all this power if you can't use it for your own benefit, right? So anyway, uh, what I try to do in that book is talk about political, economic, and cultural ideas of citizenship and how they fit into the neoliberal era. It's, it is specific to the United States in terms of its case studies but it is not specific to the United States in terms of its theoretical apparatus. And uh, it's the culmination of over 20 years working on citizenship. When I first started working on this topic, I felt very alone because people in cultural studies would basically denounce this as accommodationist, reformist, claptrap, and not something that was legitimate. Uh, then it somehow or other became uh, a la mode, I think because of the end of state socialism, at least effectively, uh, the decline of first world uh, liberal white feminism as a universalist discourse and the decline of Marxism as a first world and third world universalist discourse. Uh, this meant that people were looking at what might be future models and subjects of agency that would bring history forward and they in fact in some sense retreated to citizenship. So I try to look at some of those things there. The other issue that we've been talking about which touches on the creative industries a lot, is this idea of the makeover. This, my next book, it's, the photo's not there, but it's got lots of babies falling out of the stars and stripes. I sent this out to people like David and Kate and others to adjudicate, because I felt the cover, which was not designed by me, was a bit of a shocker. But enough people said, oh, whatever, or it's OK, that it stays. <laughs> However, it appears not to be on the site of the press Ohio State University Press, but that's the book anyway. Uh, and it, it is about this idea that the United States has as its founding mythology the notion that you need not remain that which you were born into, that there can be secular transcendence. And there are case studies about uh, everything from a lot on cosmetic surgery, uh, religion, immigration, usual grab bag. And Again, uh, this was a, a, a thing that I was working on for over 20 years, namely what I thought of as the, the life of the commodity sign. I wanted, I've always wanted to know, just as I wanted to know what citizenship meant in terms of race, gender, sexuality, and class, I wanted to know with the life of the commodity sign what it meant when the commodity sign was also a governmental sign, and I wanted to know whose sign it was at different moments, the sign maker, the sign reader, the sign trash can removalist, if you like. All those things mattered to me. And the other things that I was interested in that informed both of those books a lot were, uh, were questions of masculinity, because th this has been pretty central to a lot of my uh, concerns. And in terms of how to go about these things, what I was always trying to do was a magic elixir beyond my powers, but nevertheless something that I sought which was a combination of textual analysis, of multi-sided ethnography, and of political economy. I was frustrated by the notion that you had to make some kind of selection between these categories. I never understood why you should. Why should you read political philosophy but not literary theory? Why should you read literary criticism but not ethnography? Why should you think political economy was pessimistic and textual analysis was optimistic? I never understood this. I'd completely reject it. And that's why I found people like Bruno Latour, whom I mentioned earlier, whom Angela talked about today, Roger Chartier, I mentioned the other day, and for that matter, you know, tired old, uh, more dead white European men like Marx and Foucault, so inspirational, alongside and as part of the, the powerful stimuli from queer theory, from uh, various different kinds of feminism and so forth. Today, somewhat uh, driven by the vote that I, in a cephalogically, utterly incompetent way, called for, and that many of you kindly participated in, I decided to abandon academic publishing. Here are the results. <laughs> but the problem was, I didn't tell you you can only vote for one. So some people voted for two, some people voted for three, some people didn't vote, and some said, well, if not one, then two. So in terms of people who just did the first past the post thing, it was sort of three for number A, three for number B, three for number C, five for D, and then a number of people liked the idea of mania. But then when you put all of them together, 
and you decided, as I did, in a sort of executive arbitrariness that I could not do if Dick were here, that people who voted twice or three times would get sort of a fraction of a vote for each choice, <laughs> it ended up being completely impossible to decide what to do. However, I was saved by this, by the fact that my piece on academic publishing was already published, so I thought, well, I, we can post that on the site, which we did, and by the fact that if we have time, I don't rabbit on for too, too long. Kate actually is interested in doing this heroic Arnoldian Liebesite Olympianism at the end of today. And therefore, my version of that can wait, because I will certainly want to deliver such nonsense next week, at least nonsense when it comes from me. For that reason, <laughs> the winner is, to the extent anybody wants anything to win in this context, um, stuff to do with the state and militarism and creative industries, specifically through the fraction of electronic games, but also with a focus on electronic games labor. Now, why these things? The state of militarism really occurred to me, as I know it did to David and probably to others, in watching Lisa's presentations the other day. And the idea that the, that the military, particularly in the case of the US, which is going to be my focus this afternoon, that militaristic state activity is at the heart of the US creative industries, always has been, probably always will be. And to try to get that across with reference to electronic games, I wanted to make that clear. I also wanted to talk about how there are multiple overdeterminations of a particular sign, and one needs to understand those multiple overdeterminations and where they come from at the level of production, at the level of distribution, at the level of experience, at the level of getting rid of the sign. All these four moments, right? a kind of multiple overdeterminations both in the design and the experience of the sign. And finally, because I wanted to see what happens when you put cybertarianism, my word for the utopic fantasies of new media, alongside the mundanity of work. Because along with doing citizenship, which no one ever seemed to be interested in when I was coming up, no one that I knew was interested in work either. And 20 years ago, I started developing this idea of a new international division of cultural labor, suggesting that what had happened in the manufacturing sector with the emergence of manufacturing as something that was done offshore from the global metropole of Western Europe and the US might also be happening, was already happening, and has certainly gathered pace in the cultural domain. And again, I feel as though something that I seem of no interest to anybody suddenly is now of interest and in, frankly, much more sophisticated ways than I've been able to muster. But anyway, that's what I was, that, those are the sort of influences that are going to inform what you're going to get now. And, in, and specifically, as I said, there'll be one half about militarism and games and then another, perhaps less than a, a half, but the second part will be about labor and games. Does that sound all right? Does that sound interesting? How many of you play console games or have played console games? How many of you play or have played online games? How many of you don't know what I'm talking about at all? <laughs> okay. There used to be a time in television studies when you could say, shh, don't tell anybody else, I promise not to tell, but how many of you like soap operas? Then that became uninteresting. The next phase was, how many people here download illegally? I promise not to tell anybody. <laughs> now that that's gone, there's nothing left. But you can ask the difference between playing console games and online games and no games. So, what I want to argue is that this, there is a very intimate interpenetration of nation, state, and capital via the cultural slash creative industries. I think it's maybe best expressed uh, in a moment from 2003, how many people were in LA in 2003 at some point? Well, depending on when you were there, you may remember that the city was occupied by special forces, specifically US special forces. This was just two months after the start of our ill-starred imperialist venture in Iraq. US special forces invaded Los Angeles. Does anybody know why? Well, it was for this event the Electronic Entertainment Exposition hired the United States Special Forces to take over the inner city of Los Angeles. This is, for those who don't know it, the uh, national annual showcase of video games. More specifically, it wasn't just a matter of seeking to promote this specific forum, but more particularly, the official army game, aka America's Army. How many of you have played America's Army? 
Well, perhaps you could share with the group a little later some of your uh, personal insights. America's Army is an electronic game that is designed to recruit young people to the service of the state, which didn't clearly manage with Bill, <laughs> via simulated first-person shooting. The game includes notes to parents that stress the importance of substituting virtual experiences for what were regarded as mere vicarious insights. Effectively, this is an exciting euphemism for a kind of cyber boot camp. Unfortunately, the UCHRI is such a pacifist group of wankers that it can't load with its technology America's Army as quickly as we might hope. It seems to have rejected America's Army for loading. These special forces that took over Los Angeles were enacting a marketing triumph rather than a military one. But they also symbolized a malignant amalgam of state violence and commercial entertainment. For US culture is part of perpetual virtual war because it mixes hyper-masculinist action-adventure ideology, supinely celebratory military news coverage, and complicit new media. The trope is at once collective, we are the United States, we are here once this thing loads, to intimidate and to destroy, so it's very collective, but it's also individual, thanks to the immersive interpolation of narrative film, of current affairs, and gaming. In my other work, I've done a lot about this when it comes to Hollywood cinema and the bourgeois current affairs media. The creative industries are crucial components of the necessarily ongoing, incomplete project of constructing the nation as natural. With this project undertaken in two distinct forms that sometimes overlap, it's undertaken both through the diurnal, the very ordinary, and also the cinematic. It's undertaken, if you like, through the banal, the conventional, and the spectacular. U.S. international affairs is conducted through a techno-strategic triad, surveillance, terror, speed. Communications, electronics, radar, telemetry, photography are endowed with enormous representational authority, not just in the everyday for us, or the spectacular for us, but as specific technologies for use by technocrats inside this complex. And they are enhanced by cultural technologies that appear to render warfare virtual, how? Well, obviously via the use of simulation, but also through the supposedly low numbers, in fact, often very low numbers, of battlefield fatalities sustained by the US compared to other armies that it engages. So, for example, in the 1991 so-called Gulf War, the US lost just 270 soldiers, main, many to friendly fire, while not a single NATO troop member died in Kosovo. The 2001 invasion of Afghanistan, as opposed to what's happened since, saw one official US combatant actually killed by the opposition. What does that mean in some sense, despite the horrors that we've seen for uh, the wounded and so on gradually emerge in the latter stages of the Iraq occupation? That means that the engagement with the other has become even less intimate. Rather than flying bombardiers who are exposed to the elements, there are satellites perched in the sky that guide bombs under the distant control of shadowy specialists who use pixels for surveillance and for disembodied execution. This is the post-industrialization of conflict with desktops displacing divisions. This is the creative industry. At the same time, claims made for the precision of these technologies that they make war safer and more virtual are problematic. First Gulf War, it was asserted, for example, that US Patriot missiles destroyed all of Iraq's scuds. Independent reviews diminished that proportion to one out of 10. And of course, more importantly than that exaggeration, the impact on non-combatants is grotesque. A century ago, a hundred years ago, eight US soldiers were killed for every civilian in a war that the US participated in. That ratio is now reversed. The technological sublime makes the horror of war very distant, with casualties a blip on a screen, collateral media damage in a virtual game played by high-level strategists. Beginning as a reflection of reality, the military sign is transformed into a perversion of reality, a representation of the truth is displaced by a representation of a lie. Then, these two, one would think, a priori delineable phases, you know, a phase of truth, followed by a phase of untruth or lying, they become indistinct, they merge. The sign, this is an obvious Baudrillardian point. In fact, why would Baudrillard never 
work at UC Irvine. I mean, all the rest of them who made it into the 90s did, right? In a sort of Baudrillardian moment, the sign, in fact, comes to refer to itself. There is no residual need of correspondence to the real, which it is, in turn, transforming. That which it allegedly is its referent is, is being changed by it. Using simulated systems of weaponry to win both physical and ideological battles, the US has sought to secure borders, to exercise suzerainty, and to rattle resistance to financial globalization through what has become the only game in town, virtual war as a model, virtual war as a story, virtual war as an ideology. Simulation and dissimulation are one under the sign of the nation. Ideologically, this process disobeys the binary of private and public because it leaks willfully between capital and state with material self-interest and delusional policy cloaked in a newly installed epic binary of good against evil. Now let's hope that now we're actually online. Visitors to the Fox News site on the 31st of May 2004 encountered a grey zone, so-called. I'm now taking you to the current page of the relevant element, Kuma War. Anybody know about Kuma War? Okay. On one side of the page, on the 31st of May, or a US soldier in battle gear prowled the streets of Baghdad. On the other, a terror handbook promised to facilitate, and I quote, understanding and facing the threat to America under the banner, War on Terror, sponsored by Kuma War. This is a major gaming company, Kuma War. The Kuma War game includes online missions which have titles like Fallujah, Battle in Sara City, and Uday and Kusay's Last Stand. My apologies for my pronunciations. The legitimacy and realism of Kuma are underwritten by the fact that the firm is run by retired US military officers and is used as a recruiting tool by their former colleagues who remain in the US military. Both sides benefit from the company's website which invites soldiers to pen their battlefield experiences, a neat way of getting intellectual property gratis in the name of the nation. The site boasts that, and I quote, Kuma War, and there it is, is a series of playable recreations of real events in the war on terror. Nearly a hundred playable missions bring our soldiers' heroic stories to life, and you can get them all right now for free. Stop watching the news and get in the game. Anybody tells you Altasay isn't relevant anymore? I rest my case. Once again, a technological sublime that fetishizes materiel is doing dread work. Many critics have expressed shock that US journalists embedded with the US military for the Iraq invasion declared that experience as like a video game. These naifs shouldn't be so taken aback because gaming is crucial to war and vice versa. War games became systematic training practices in the late 19th century at the US Naval War College game. They were simulations of Prussian and French field tactics. Such methods gained in popularity after remarkable success in predicting the Japanese campaign in the Pacific from 1942. By the late 50s, computers were utilized to theorize games and to play them by the US military. And of course, stepping away for the moment from this highly applied sphere, those of you who uh, historians of the social sciences will know that game theory in 1960s and 70s political science as Warcraft sought to scientize the study and the practice of what was called crisis decision making. What was this organized around? Something that those of you who don't know about that history will be familiar with. A rational actor model of maximizing utility reapplied to the conduct of states, soldiers and diplomats. You're trying to construct potential nuclear war prospects and counters you put yourself into the mind's eye of the Soviet or the PRC apparatchik. Then, of course, with the decline of Keynesianism across the 1970s, game theory's ideal typical monadic subject came to dominate economics and political science more generally. Those broader collective institutional norms that we were hearing about earlier today were done away with by the fetishization of the calculating ratiocinative solitary figure. Utility maximization even overtook parts of Marxism, which in the past, of course, had tended to favor collective rather than selfish models of choice. Games were, in fact, everywhere you looked. And that notion of individuals out for themselves remains in vogue, re-stimulated through electronic games, most of which uh, in the early days were invented by the US military 
uh, on the part of defense contractors. The Pentagon worked with Atari in the 1980s to develop Battlezone, an arcade game, for use as a flight simulator for fighter pilots. And at the same time, the National Defense University created a gaming center. In the early 1990s, the end of what I call Cold War II wrought economic havoc on many corporations that had been involved in the US defense industry. Those of you who are in California will realize what an extraordinary impact that had on the entire state economy at that time. Well, what did these corporations that had basically had a unique arrangement with the defense industry do when suddenly, 1991, 92, 93, the contracts weren't coming? They turned to the games industry as a natural supplement to what had been their principal, in fact, only customer, the military. And today's new geopolitical crisis sees these firms, what have become things like Quantum 3D, Martin Marietta, and so on, conducting half their games business with the so-called private market and half with the Pentagon. The US military, the mismanaged, misdirected, but masterful behemoth that underpins uh, globalization, the behemoth calculates that it needs 80,000 recruits a year to maintain world dominance. The military diplomatic fiscal disasters of the latest R-word period of hegemony have jeopardized the steady supply of new troops since 2001, imperiling the army's stature as the nation's biggest employer of people aged 17 to 24. At the same time as neophytes have become very hard to attract to the military due to the perils of war, recruits to militaristic game design have stepped up to the plate big time nationalistic designers volunteering their services. Their mission, they have appeared to accept with alacrity, has been to interpolate the country's youth by situating their bodies and minds to fire the same weapons to face the same issues as on the battlefield. TV commercials, you must have seen them, depict soldiers directly addressing gamers, urging them to show their manliness by volunteering for the real thing and serving abroad to secure US power. Until recently, players of the uh, commercial game Doom 2, anybody played Doom 2? Could also download, download Marine Doom. As you'll see from this page, it's hit that dreadful category of no longer used, the retirement category, the AARP category. <laughs> Maroon, Marine, Maroon, Marine Doom was a Marine Corps modification of the original that was developed after the Corps Commandant issued a directive that games would improve tactics. Also, Sony's US Navy SEALs website links directly to the Corps' own page. For the scholarly advocates of corporate culture proliferating game studies and creative industries discourse, this doesn't appear to be a problem. Every time I look at the work that they produce about these topics, I hear nothing but technicism and celebration. In their view, and I quote from a couple of them, Games serve the national interest by entertaining consumer citizens and creating a consumer-based demand for military technology. And then the, the kicker, this is unrelated to real violence in the domestic sphere. The game America's Army that I started with is variously said by these cybertarian advocates of the creative industries to be just a logical construct or a stimulus to a vibrant counter-public sphere, a Habermasian wet dream in which veterans dispute the bona fides of non-military players. It is allegedly America's army, discussion groups that spring up between players, a contested site where what began as a recruitment device, as I told you at the beginning, has developed into, and I quote from a creative industries avatar, as it were, a place where civilians and service folk discuss the serious experience of real life war. Well, not surprisingly, there is a material history to this sanguine outlook, and it lies in the sordid links of research schools, cybertarians, and the military. In 1996, the US National Academy of Sciences held a workshop for academia, for Hollywood, and for the Pentagon together on the topic of simulation and games. The next year, the National Research Council, for those of you not from the US, these are not actually public bodies in the sense of governmental bodies. They're quasi-governmental, but they're funded by foundations for the most part. 
The next year, the National Research Council announced a collaborative research agenda in popular culture and militarism. Not the problems of one reflecting the other or vice versa, but how to bring them closer and closer together. It convened meetings to streamline such cooperation, everywhere from special effects to training simulations, from immersive technologies to simulated networks. Since that time, untold numbers of academic journals and institutes on games have become closely tied to the Pentagon. They generate research designed to test and augment the recruiting and the training potential of games to ideologize, to hire, and to instruct the population. For example, the Center for Computational Analysis of Social and Organizational Systems at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, the same place, of course, where the, the Floridian began his evil work, promulgate studies underwritten by the Office of Naval Research and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. How many of you have heard of DARPA? I imagine a lot, right? DARPA is blissfully happy to use its $2 billion annual budget to examine how, for example, social networking, how wonderful and demotic a tool this is, how social networking uncovers the top America's army players, to use DARPA's language, and their distinct behaviors, right? In order to work out the optimum size of an America's army team, the importance of fire volume towards opponents, the recommended communication structure and content of organization on the battlefield, and the contribution of unity among team members. You give America's army to recruit to test whether they're valuable. You give America's army to current combatants to see who should be in charge on the battlefield. More than that, anybody here either from or been to Orlando in Florida? Orlando, Orlando FLA is known to DARPA officially as Team Orlando. Why? Because the city houses Disney's research and development Imagineers, the University of Central Florida's Institute for Simulation and Training, Lockheed Martin, the nation's biggest military contractor, and the Pentagon's Institute for Simulation and Training, all of which work together. A little closer to here, in the same barrio where I live, Marina del Rey, in LA is the University of Sport Children's Institute for Creative Technologies, or ICT. ICT was set up as a means of articulating scholars, film and television producers, game designers, and the Pentagon. It was formally opened 10 years ago by the Secretary of the Army and the head of the Motion Picture Association of America, who might be the same person but actually aren't. It started out with $45 million of public money. This, for a film industry that we all know, is totally laissez-faire and driven purely by the supply and demand mechanics that mean that our pleasures and desires all over the world determine exactly what is delivered by Hollywood. $45 million of federal government budget, a figure that was doubled four years ago in the renewal that inevitably DARPA gave. ICT uses military money and Hollywood muscle to test out homicidal technologies and narrative scenarios, all under the aegis of faculty from film studies, film production, engineering, and communication studies. Companies such as Pandemic, part owned by Bono, the high corporate moralist, the man who packs a suitcase and a valise along with his CDs. Companies like Pandemic that he partly owns are big investors in ICT. ICT also collaborates on major motion pictures. Who here has seen Spider-Man 2? Sam Raimi's Visions, brought to you directly by DARPA. Who designed the workplace at ICT? The guy who designed the workplace for the Star Trek franchise. ICT produces a number of wonderful Pentagon recruitment tools. Choose your battle. Who prefers Full Spectrum Warrior versus Ten hammers. Bill, I get the feeling you may know these. <laughs> a man who's fallen silent. Anybody else got a preference? Available now. Full Spectrum Warrior is something that you can pay to play, but it also doubles formally as a training device for military operations in urban terrain. What's good for the Xbox is good for the combat simulator. The utility of these innovations continues in combat. They're not just training operations. So, for example, the Pentagon knows that a lot of off-duty soldiers, and I mean people who are actually in theater in combat, right? Not people who are back at home. When they're relaxing, to the extent they can, under the incredible pressure and stress that these men and women experience, a lot of them play games. But there's a problem. Many of them don't play militarized games. 
Many of them are playing online and console computer games that are skater games. How do we stop them relaxing in this way? The idea is to turn them away from things like skater games or collaborative games or socially oriented games towards these virtual training manuals. So for instance, Full Spectrum Warrior is promoted to, to game players who don't like playing first person shooter games on patriotic grounds. It is promoted by the US military as, quote, the game that captured Saddam. Because the men who dug Hussein out had been trained with it. And these games have become crucial tools not only for those who are being weaned from skater games and other non-violent pastimes, but also because fewer and fewer nation slash sovereign states allow the United States to conduct live war games on their terrain. Over the past decade of the R-word hegemony, countries don't want us anywhere closer to them than they can possibly manage. They certainly don't want our soldiers anywhere near them. So the virtuality becomes even more crucial. Let's return to where we began, to America's Army, the unloadable by UCHRI and all its limp-wristed pacifism game, and its story. The Naval Postgraduate School's modeling, virtual environments, and simulation academic program had developed a game many years ago called Operation Starfighter, based on a personal favorite of mine, the film The Last Starfighter. I can see many of you remember this epic of the Hollywood motion picture art form. The next step America's army was farmed out to another champion of the private sector resistance to the nasty Western European, Asia Pacific, and Middle Eastern emphasis on the state providing culture, namely George Lucas's companies, which of course can't survive unless the military give them deals to do with lots of money and not a lot of pressure to produce something. And so, they developed what became America's Army. It was launched with due symbolism on the 4th of July, 2002. Duly symbolic. Why? Because that Independence Day doubles as a key date in the film industry's summer rollout of new features. Dude, blockbuster popcorn date movie <laughs> plus America's Army. Awesome. In fact, so awesome that the military had to bring additional servers into play because a mere 400,000 dudes downloaded the game on the 4th of July 02. No doubt including no one in this building. And in fact, it's impossible to download it in this building. <laughs> Who would have been here on the 4th of July? Well, that's the next question. How many of you read GameSpot PC Reviews, an excellent magazine that I commend to all? <laughs> there are two of I'm sorry. The Rick was trying to make people feel guilty. I've identified two people, right, both in green, directly opposite one another, who are the bad people in the room. GameSpot TV Reviews, PC Reviews, sorry, awarded the game a high rating textually and was equally impressed by the business model, which means that taxpayers fund homicidal narratives, as always. As of February this year, five and a half years after that triumphant 400,000 person download, America's Army had a mere nine million registered users. Five years after its release, and this is almost unprecedented, it remained one of the 10 most played games online. Civilian developers regularly refresh it by consulting veterans, that's veterans of the real military, and by participating in physical war games when they're conducted in the few countries that will allow us to do so. And there are power texts that provide additional forms of promotional renewal. AmericasArmy.com slash community, for those of you who fetishize community, takes full advantage of the usual array of cybertarian fantasies about the new media as civil society. Guess what? It uses that language because it has things called community fora, internet chat, fan sites, and virtual competitions. And of course, the game is also formally commodified through privatization, bought by the French firm. Who knew the French did this kind of tough guy stuff? I had no idea. I knew they had some empire once, but didn't they give John Kerry a medal or something? <laughs> bought by Ubisoft to be repurposed for games consoles, arcades, and cell phones, and turned into figurines by the allegedly edgy, independent creative industries company, Radioactive Clown. Such a lovely name. Come on down, Mr. and Ms. Creative Industries, 
and your Cybertarian progeny claim your prize. Tournaments are convened replete with hundreds of thousands of dollars in prize money given by the Pentagon, maybe? Perhaps not George Lucas? Perhaps not Ubisoft? And there are similar events at military recruiting sites. Some of you may have played these. With over 40 million downloads, with websites about the game by the thousand, the message has travelled far and wide. An excellent return on the initial public investment of actually only $19 million dollars with five million budgeted for annual updates. And in case you're wondering, this is all very well to claim in some political, economic, conspiratorial mode that our children's minds are being molded by this stuff. There actually are some active audience studies. Guess what they show? Well, blow me down. Studies of young people who have positive attitudes to the US military, which is actually a minority amongst US young people who have the most negative attitudes to the US military of any cohort in the country, indicate that 30% of them form that view through playing the game. And one of the things about the game is that it basically is, as they've managed, as I understand it, to engineer it, unlike virtually any other game, so that you can't have a gestalt, right? It's not possible to, in a sense, modify your role by reversing it. You know how in lots of other games, savvy people can actually be the one suffering in the, in the shooter game or whatever? I don't think anybody's been able to do that with America's Army. You can't experience the pain of the other in America's army. And guess what? Because of that, perhaps, who knows, it sports a teen rating, and it's regarded as the most effective of all US military recruiting tools, above the personal, above the filmic, above the educational visits to schools and colleges. The invasion of Los Angeles by special forces in 2003 had worked, and it was an invasion by capitalism as much as nationalism. However, virtual blowback was underway. Al-Qaeda has actually learned tactics by playing America's army and other games and developing counters of their own. And here's, does anybody know this guy, this artist, Joseph Delap? I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He creates counter texts online by typing the details, very tragically, perhaps obscenely, of soldiers who have died in combat into the game under the moniker Dead in Iraq. You can go to this site to see the work that he does. Perhaps the unholy trinity of media, Pentagon, and screen was unwittingly relating opponents. All right, that's the first two thirds, last third, okay? I want to turn now to the Janus face of creative industries labor. Why Janus faced or Janus faced? Why double sided? Because creative industries labor is undertaken by those who buy creative industries products or consume them in any, in any way, as well as by those who make them. Consider supposedly cybertarian environments, and I'm thinking here of the world cyber games or Second Life. Anybody else? I'm, an, I'm on Second Life. Anybody else on Second Life? Do people know what Second Life is? Well, anyway. It's a massively multiplayer online game, or MOG. MOG virtual worlds provide a billion dollars revenue a year in Europe and the United States, and they have seen Korea and China surpass Japan as key markets. They've completely outstripped the console sector in that sense, partly because they're very hard to pirate. And women outnumber men as participants in online games, uh, unlike the situation with console games. It is said that this is because they are social collaborative enterprises. Originating primarily through freeware and extra commercial organization through people who are not working for salary, they are nevertheless increasingly corporatized and governmentalized. There is no split in this world between commodification and governmentalization. By things I mentioned the other day, end user license agreements or EULAs, E-U-L-A is the acronym, these EULAs mean that when players who are paying money for the privilege to play, when they invent new ideas, they add value to corporate property. In the three years from its public opening, which was 03, Second Life, built by residents, remember, attracted well over a million participants from across the globe. But even this utopia was animated by pioneering and suburbanizing discourses of possessive individualism and collective marshalling far distant from communal utopias of the kind that animate simpletons such as myself, Second Life promises the perfect parcel of land to build your house or business, 
And of course, a unit of currency convertible to Yankee dollars at online exchanges. It comes as no surprise that this entrepreneurial fantasy, seemingly springing from the hearts of cybertarian consumers such as ourselves, was founded with money from Jeff Bezos, who runs Mitch Kapoor, who runs Lotus, and Pierre Omidya, who runs eBay. Or that Wells Fargo, uh, currently the best rated bank in the US, but that doesn't mean much, sports a branded island within the environment. Linden Laboratories, which owns and operates Second World, does software work that permits inventiveness by others, though they must pay to gain real estate. More overtly corporate, and a crucial part of the way in which surveillance of those who are playing games, of their consuming habits, of their demographic lifestyles, is absolutely central to the financial success of these things, is the much beloved by me, HSX, or Hollywood Stock Exchange. Who's played on the HSX? Where have you, do you people read poetry or something? I don't understand. <laughs> the Hollywood Stock Exchange was founded in 1996 and sold to Cantor Fitzgerald, where so many employees tragically lost their lives in December that year a Wall Street firm in 2001. HSX was conceived as a game to take advantage of the public's obsession with box office numbers, said one of the founders. But the real plan, the real business animation, was to sell forecasts based on information it collects on the folks who frequent the site. By 2004, it had a million registered users, most of whom are affluent young white men. And what do they do? They trade stocks of movies, and bonds of stars. They also trade music groups. And so this means you get to know the preferences of the wealthiest people in the world. HSX makes up starting prices based on past performances and sales, and then lets trading determine price fluctuations. It operates a lot like a conventional Wall Street exchange. Cantor sells research about the dupes who play this to film studios. Because what is it? It's a real-time update of consumer opinion using the predictive market versus going out on the street with a clipboard and asking people questions. So those of you who are textualists because you're frightened of others and don't want to do ethnography, here's your future. There is also now a sports stock exchange. And the sports stock exchange was begun to coincide with the Men's World Cup of Association Football, a.k.a. soccer. The company boasts about potential reuse, and I quote, of data collected from the exchange as market research to entertainment, consumer product, and financial institutions, and as original content to radio, television, and print media. Players are played. They are made into samples and samplers for predicting cultural taste. This is the, the, the interactivity that matters, and it's called surveillance. It does what these people call crack human personality in real time. They call their enterprise cracking human personality in real time and turning it into global data. And then, of course, and this is where I'm going to conclude, there is surveillance of more formal workers in this cybertarian happy utopia of our gaming era. Here I'm talking not about players who pay money and whose intellectual property is stolen from them, I'm talking about the workers who create the games. Some of you may have worked creating games. I don't know, anybody here? Anybody, anybody? Good. You all look pretty well, that's probably why. Big publishers develop exploitative labor practices as their power increases via the destruction and purchase of small businesses and the insertion of those small businesses into the new international division of cultural labor that I mentioned briefly at the beginning. Take, for instance, Rockstart a British company with a studio in Vancouver, Canada, that made Grand Theft Auto and its successors. How does their game process start? How is, in a sense, Grand Theft Auto and its children generated? It starts when someone builds a demonstration model and shows it to the company. The company then shows it to the press, to the media, to say, what do you think of this? That firm, the firm then generally decides to ready the game in time for Christmas sales. So this show has probably happened in February of a, of a particular year. They want to be able to sell it so that it'll be given as a gift at Christmas time. By March, they've only got about six months left because they want to have it at market in late September. And so they require all employees to be present 60 hours a week. 
And the return on this is that you will get a bonus when the game is shipped. Then management, each time the game is delivered, goes over it and insists on changes, often in consultation with reviewers from the independent game media. By June, people are working 80 hours a week or they're fired. Then suddenly the company finds the product won't in fact be available in time for the Christmas sales, so it decides we've missed that, we'll change the shipment date, we'll make it next March, but nevertheless you've all got to work at the same rate anyway, and the bonus disappears further and further out of sight. It migrates into the future. Let's take another case that's become very public. How many of you have been bid welcome at some point in your lives to the lovely world of electronic arts, or EA? Anybody an EA person? There's now, there are now two or three others to join the culprits. Right. Right. And those of you who flew into LAX, there are in what used to be the Hughes Aircraft area that's partly Loyola and Marymount, you will also see down the hill in Playa del Rey, uh, near the Bayona wetlands, the big electronic arts complex. EA makes The Sims. People heard of The Sims or played it, perhaps? Well, if you work for electronic arts, you're under monumental pressure all the time, both in terms of the need to create more and more product for the global market and to compete with other workers at home and offshore in concert with the nickel. But in 2004, the blogger EA underscore spouse burst onto the internet scene. Are people familiar with EA underscore spouse? She's kind of the godhead figure for me. We love EA underscore spouse. Mm -hmm. Using this pseudonym of disgruntled spouse, as she calls herself, she posted a vibrant account of grotesque exploitation experienced by her fiancé and others at EA via something called Live Journal. And you can go back and see all the string that associated with this protest. She eloquently ripped back the veneer of joyous cybertarianism from games development, noting that EA's claim to blend aesthetics and technology. Does anybody know their, their corporate trademark? Challenge everything, right, is the corporate trademark. And of course their name, Electronic Arts. That, that the name and the trademark belied both the company's treatment of workers and what its products were. Relabor, subject, the subject of labor, EA underscore spouse wrote, to any EA executive that happens to read this, I have a good challenge for you. How about safe and sane labor practices for the people on whose backs you walk for your millions? And on the subject of texts, she challenged in the following way. And I quote, Churning out one licensed football game after another doesn't sound like challenging much of anything to me. It sounds like a money farm, unquote. And then she goes on in various posts to detail the exploitation, getting back to this language of the crunch that I mentioned with reference to the other company, Rockstar. A putatively limited pre-crunch is announced, such that 48-hour work weeks are mandatory, with the alibi that months of this will obviate the need for a real crunch at the conclusion of development. But then, as with Rockstar, the, the pre-crunch goes on beyond its deadline. Then 72-hour work weeks are mandated. That crunch passes its promised end. Then illness strikes and irritability strikes. Then there's a new crunch announced where everybody must work between 85 and 91-hour weeks, this is from 9 in the morning till 10 at night, Monday through Sunday inclusive, but once a month you get Saturday night off after 6.30. <laughs> there's no overtime, there's no leave in return for this massive expenditure of talent and time amongst people who thought they were A, first world workers, B, educated workers, and C, in the forefront of the best kind of work practice imaginable in the bold new economy. The workers discern no measurable impact from the crunch other than on themselves. So many errors are made from fatigue that time is needed to correct them. Turnover amongst engineering workers, highly qualified people who could go everywhere, runs at 50%. Now at the time this was happening, those of you who were readers of Fortune magazine might have noted in 2004 that EA was ranked amongst the 100 best companies in the world to work for. And then there's the Great Place to Work Institute in the Bay Area. Anybody familiar with the Great Place to Work Institute? You are? 
Well, they ranked it 91 amongst corporations, and I quote, that try hard to do right by their staff. It's hard not to be as satirical uh, as I am being. I find it very difficult, and I apologize for those who find this overbearing. In an interview with Fortune, given as a consequence of the high rating, EA described itself as a one-class society. So remember, one of the things about these institutions is that they see themselves as virtual worlds, getting back to the militarism with which I began, with virtuality. They are a one-class society. And there's a wonderful, but to me, astonishing dictum that was enunciated at that time by their Vice President of Human Resources. And I'll, I'll quote it to you in full. It's not very long. Most creativity, there's the C word, comes at one of two times. When your back is up against the wall or in a time of calm. Unquote. Now I find this firing squad analogy more than slightly alarming, but don't worry. Fortune magazine was onto the fact that some readers would think that backs to the wall didn't sound too nice. So it said, workers can, and I quote, <laughs> I can't believe this is, this is anyway, whatever. Refresh their energy with free espresso. <laughs> or by playing volleyball and basketball. Last year, of course, because of the remarkable free espresso and the opportunity to play volleyball and basketball, the firm had gone up. It was ranked 62 now in the magazine's list of industry stars. Meanwhile, EA, EA underscore spouse's brave intervention, as we say in cultural studies, or outburst, as they would say in creative industries, generated febrile and substantial responses to live journal. What do bees include? Calls for unionization, appeals to federal and state labor machinery, confirmation that EA was horrendous, but by no means aberrant, frustration that the bourgeois press, the ones who were brought in to do the interesting early product reviews and give feedback, the bourgeois press was disinclined to investigate or even report the situation, and then a series of wonderful denunciations of asinine managerialism and anal private sector bureaucracy. I quote from a couple of these, my favorites. The, the average game company manager is quite possibly the worst qualified leader of people in the world. <laughs> Plus a recognition of how IPR, intellectual property rights, make labor disposable. And I quote, I'm beginning to think that EA is really nothing more than a licensing warehouse. They'll always be able to recruit naive talent to slave away. Alienating talent is not a big problem for them. And, I, and I, that's the end of the quotation. But labor solidarity remains compromised by job threats from around the world and by non-disclosure agreements, which send a chill through conversations across employment silos. To sum up, the global gaming industry is essentially, I think, a rather banal repetition of Hollywood history minus unions. Domination by firms that buy up or destroy small businesses and centralize power in the metropole. Decimation of little bedroom concerns in favor of giant conglomerates. Those of you in California must know people who worked for fun, small gaming startups. They got swallowed, the IP was taken out, the workers were treated shabbily. A working mythology of consumer power right at the center of the ethos of the company of any of these companies, and of course, massive, silent, salient underwriting by the state. So what's our task as critics, in my view, as translators, as David said on the first day? We need to follow the money, we need to follow the labor, we need to follow the high-tech trash, and of course, we need to follow the text. And we also need to follow uh, the noted political economist of communications, Vincent Mosco, when he reminds us that once the utopic slash dystopic couplet of new communications technologies and new cultural genres has been played out, that's when the real work begins. At the moment when he turns the page and he reads that, the mythic period of alarm and fantasy has given way to banality, when technological culture that's been innovated is neither hailed nor derided, but silently normalized. Then we can transcend the same tired choice that is placed again and again before the putatively sovereign rational consumer, what Moscow calls the freedom to choose after all the major political, economic, and social decisions have already been made. And we are left, if we don't do that, as naive cheerleaders for a discourse of creative industries.
which beguiles us by putting arts and humanities at the economic and social core. Thank you.